Hello, I'm Esther Gido Yort. It's Tuesday, September 14th. This is Africa 54. International aid groups press Burkina Faso's government to let them help register internally displaced people desperate for food and safe shelter. As more countries demand COVID vaccinations and so-called passport proof of them, the push for both is getting strong criticism. Now the Ghanaian boxer Samuel Takyi has a Tokyo Olympic bronze medal. He wants to launch a pro career in the ring. We begin in West Africa where international aid groups are appealing to Burkina Faso's government to allow them help register the country's internally displaced people. The Norwegian Refugee Council says the government is taking weeks to register IDPs for food and other aid, forcing some to return to dangerous areas. Henry Wilkins reports from Waiguya. In a statement released Monday, the Norwegian Refugee Council, NRC, said government authorities are taking weeks to register IDPs, like these 500 or so, who until recently stayed at a school in the town of Waguya. The NRC say they could carry out the registration process, which is essential before aid can be distributed to IDPs, within a week, and implored the government to, quote, let us step in and support. As Marta Wadrago, who is living in the school, fled her village of Nongo with her young son after a terror attack. They were wearing army uniforms, so it was difficult to know if they were terrorists. I had to hide myself for two days in my house. She says she arrived in Waguya around two months ago, and so far her family has received $100 in aid payments. The first thing we need is food for us and our children and then some clothes, among other things. The community leader of the IDPs says this month students will return to their studies, so the school's owner has asked the IDPs to move out. Local authorities sent them to a site outside of the town, where access to food and services is difficult. At the very beginning, we were able to have some cereal like maize and millet, plus $100 for each family. But that was two or three months ago. Some people arrived recently, and those people have got no food so far. Many of the IDPs who stayed at the school say they are unsure of whether they've been registered or not, but say none of them are receiving enough aid. But authorities really lack the capacity um, to, to count and register uh, newly displaced people. And meanwhile, aid organizations are not allowed to intervene. So this is what we are asking for today. We need more flexibility. In a tense press conference Monday, the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs said this when asked why offers of assistance from aid groups were being turned down. You asked why we don't make it easier for the partners if they can do it better than the locals, but why them? Because they have the resources? Because they have the machines? Our nation has the expertise to do it. Why don't we make use of this material expertise so that the locals can do it themselves? As the school now lies empty, waiting for the students to return, the IDPs who resided there remain in need of help. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Waguya, Burkina Faso. Nigeria is experiencing one of its worst cholera outbreaks in years, with more than 2,300 people dying from suspected cases. Meanwhile, the West African nation continues to battle the coronavirus pandemic. Nearly 70,000 suspected cholera infections had been recorded as of September 5th in 25 of Nigeria's 36 states and the capital Abuja, according to the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. Ese Omukoro says her brother was seriously ill with cholera recently and finally admitted to the fourth hospital they went to ask for medical help. He was released last week. Please, the government should try their best to at least give us good water and the rest to avoid that kind of sickness because that sickness is not a good, it's a very terrible sickness, it's a bad experience as well. 
Nigerian authorities are concerned the 2,300 deaths linked to cholera may actually be higher because many affected communities are in hard-to-reach areas. Children between 5 and 14 years old are also the most affected age group. Nigeria is still facing a third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is now mainly driven by the Delta variant. Authorities are trying to ramp up the vaccination campaign with less than 1% of the population having received a one dose of vaccine. A growing number of countries are mandating COVID-19 vaccinations and are requiring vaccine passports to show proof of immunization against the disease. Medical observers say preventing infection through the vaccine may help end the coronavirus pandemic. But the move is drawing strong criticism. Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu has the story. To mandate or not to mandate? That is the question that is fueling worldwide debate over the COVID-19 vaccine. Many experts say vaccination is one of the most effective ways to lower the spread of the virus. However, vaccinations are meeting some opposition and hesitancy. As health officials aim to have more people get the shot, countries are imposing various measures to increase vaccination rates. In South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa on Sunday announced plans to introduce COVID-19 vaccine passports. Africa's worst virus hit country by the coronavirus is also struggling with widespread skepticism of the jab. Government has secured sufficient vaccines to vaccinate the entire adult population and the supply of vaccines is no longer a constraint. We will also be providing further information on an approach for vaccine passports, which can be used as evidence of vaccination for various purposes and events. So that as people go around, they are able to demonstrate that yes, they've been vaccinated through the cell phone or other form of demonstration. Vaccine passports are a digital or paper documents that show that a person has been vaccinated against COVID-19. They are being required in some countries to enter some venues, such as nightclubs or restaurants, or for travel. The COVID vaccine passport is not without controversy and has led to protests. The British government has just abandoned plans to introduce COVID passports in England. At the moment, I mean, both uh, Saj, Sajid the Javid, the, the health secretary, and Nadim Zahawi, uh, the vaccines minister, are, they're both right. And what we want to do is avoid uh, vaccine passports if we possibly can. And that's what we're, uh, we're, that's the course we're on. But I think you've got to be prudent and you've got to, to keep things in reserve uh, in case things change. Well, obviously, that's right. A growing number of countries are introducing mandatory COVID-19 vaccination for certain groups. This includes health workers in many countries, federal employees and contractors in the United States, nursing home staff and caregivers in Greece, and firefighters in France beginning on September 15th. In the Gambia, authorities began imposing vaccinations in mid-August on tourism workers. Zimbabwe is warning that civil servants refusing the vaccination should resign. Large businesses like Disney and Goldman Sachs have made COVID vaccinations mandatory for their employees. The World Health Organization reports that at least 4.5 million people have died from COVID-19, but more than 200 million have recovered from the virus. Linor Mudu, VOA News, Washington. Kenya's first low-cost airline, Jumbo Jet, started a flight service to the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo city of Goma on Friday. The airline says it is looking to tap into a projected jump in demand for air travel in Africa. Olivia Chan reports. Kenya's first budget airline has started flights into the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo city, Goma. Jambo Jet says it's looking to tap into a projected lift in demand for air travel in Africa. The carrier expects the continent to become one of the fastest growing regions for aviation in the world within the next two decades. 
with average annual expansion of nearly 5%. Chief Executive Karanja Ndegwa says they are in a strong position to take advantage. So basically for now, we are the big, biggest low-cost carriers in the region. So for us, is, um, is, the market is quite big and we will grow and serve the market and grow within the region uh, to the point of even setting up hubs within the region. Currently, we are setting our second hub in Mombasa. Uh, Nairobi is our main hub. Our second hub is, um, is, uh, is, is, is Mombasa. And who knows what Goma brings. Jambojack will fly into Goma, the capital of the rest of North Kivu province, twice a week from Nairobi. The airline is launched in 2014 and is owned by national carrier Kenya Airways. It embarked on an expansion drive three years ago, aiming to double its annual number of passengers. But some of those plans were delayed by the global health crisis. And it's not alone in now expanding into DRC. Kenya's biggest banks, KCB and Equity, have also been moving into the relatively untapped market. That was Olivia Chan of Reuters with that report. China has given its backing Tuesday to a Congolese provincial government's order last month banning six small Chinese-owned mining companies operating illegally. The move comes as Democratic Republic of Congo's President Felix Shisekedi increases scrutiny of Chinese mining activities, reviewing a $6 billion infrastructure for minerals deal with Chinese investors and reassessing China's molybdenum's 10K Fungurume mine. The governor of Congo's eastern South Kivu province, Theo Kasi, suspended the operations of the six small Chinese companies on August 20th, ordering all local and foreign staff to leave the sites. Kasi says the suspension came after the companies missed a deadline to register the activities with the authorities. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is defending the U.S. evacuation from Afghanistan. On Monday, for the first time before a congressional panel, lawmakers, Republicans, as well as several Democrats, criticized the White House's handling of the chaotic August withdrawal that ended the longest war in U.S. history. The U.S. congressional correspondent Catherine Gibson has more. Two weeks after the last U.S. flight left Kabul, ending the nearly 20-year U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan. U.S. lawmakers questioning Biden administration officials for the first time for failing to anticipate the Taliban's rapid takeover of the country and for sticking to an August 31st deadline for the U.S. withdrawal. There's no evidence that staying longer would have made the Afghan security forces or the Afghan government any more resilient or self-sustaining. If 20 years and hundreds of billions of dollars in support, equipment and training did not suffice, why would another year, another five, another 10? The administration has defended the chaotic and deadly evacuation that turned into the largest airlift in U.S. history. The U.S. and its allies evacuated 124,000 people most of them Afghans, after the fall of Kabul on August 15th. Republicans say the White House could have avoided those images of chaos, which damaged the United States' reputation internationally. We went into Afghanistan in the first place because uh, the Taliban had harbored uh, al-Qaeda, uh, correct? And they attacked us on September 11th. Um, now, 20 years later, we have the Taliban back in charge there and they have billions and billions of dollars worth of our equipment and our weaponry. Uh, and, and once again, they're a haven for, for terrorists. How is this not a debacle of monumental proportions? Blinken telling lawmakers that while the U.S. effort in Afghanistan did neutralize the threat from al-Qaeda, there was a larger lesson to learn about U.S. involvement overseas. While we are very effective uh, at dealing with terrorist threats to our country uh, and eliminating them, uh, which we did very successfully in Afghanistan, the idea of using military force to try to remake a society uh, is something that uh, is beyond our means and beyond our capacity. Uh, and we need to think really hard about whether we want to engage 
uh, in these enterprises going forward. And while some Democratic lawmakers have criticized the way the White House handled the withdrawal, they argue Biden was put in an impossible situation by the deal negotiated by former President Donald Trump. Let me remind everyone that Trump's deal forced the Afghan government to release 5,000 prisoners and offered international legitimacy to the Taliban. It was a deal that failed to require the Taliban to separate from al-Qaeda terrorists and did not require the Taliban to stop attacking the Afghan government. The deal altered the political order of the country. The U.S. has not recognized the Taliban as the official government of Afghanistan. Blinken said Monday that about 100 Americans are waiting to be evacuated from Afghanistan and that the State Department was accelerating the approval process for Afghan special immigrant visa applicants. Katherine Gibson, VOA News, Washington. Let us know what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come. After winning a bronze medal in Tokyo, a Ghanaian boxer is ready to turn pro. Plus, Hedy Adams tells us what's coming up on Wednesday's edition of Straight Talk Africa. Join me on the next Straight Talk Africa. As countries worldwide work to get shots in arms, many are running into a problem of trust and vaccine hesitancy. Is fake news to blame? And is misinformation on social media hurting vaccination drives across Africa? We'll speak to Ugandan Dr. Joachim Chikomeko, also a professional fact checker, as well as a data journalist, to help us separate medical facts from fiction. Also, shutdowns, showdowns, and crackdowns. We'll Look at the power struggle between big tech and politicians. Join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. watching Africa 54. The United States has commemorated the 20th anniversary of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attack that killed nearly 3,000 people. Speaking with VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Bob, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin says he sees transnational terrorist activity around the world, including in Somalia, where a number of organizations are seeking to operate freely. I think uh, what what you've seen and what, what you know to be true is that uh, transnational terrorists will look for ungoverned spaces to go to, to to operate out of. And so everywhere on the globe where we see, you know, breakdown in governance or weak governance uh, or areas that are ungoverned, uh, we can expect that at some point uh, that uh, there's a possibility that terrorist activity will, will take root in those places. And so if you had to you said you've mentioned some areas to us in the briefing room. So if you had to pick one area where the focus seems to be most intent on attacking the U.S. homeland, where, where is that right now? Well, um, I certainly don't want to get into any intelligence uh, assessments here, but I mean, we, we see terrorist, transnational terrorist uh, activity in a lot of places. Uh, we, we see uh, certainly in Africa, we see uh, in, in Somalia, we see a number of uh, of organizations uh, looking to operate freely there. Are you looking to put troops back in Somalia? Uh, again, I won't. I don't have any troop announcements to make uh, in in this forum. So let's talk about because we're still bogged down in Afghanistan. Uh, we don't have troops there, but we are still bogged down with counterterror war. So won't that divert your attention away from China and Russia for at least some time? Well, I, we we know that that. Uh, we have to maintain a focus in order to defend this country. 
which is my top priority, we have to maintain a focus on, uh, on countering transnational terrorism and preventing uh, uh, terrorists from exporting terror from any place on the globe to our homeland. And we will remain focused on that with a laser focus. So yes, they will, they will bog us down for some time? No, I, that, that's, that's, that's not bogging us down. That's making sure that, uh, that we, we pay attention to the threats as they evolve. But it won't prevent us from doing what we need to do to focus on uh, our major uh, uh, elements here, our major challenges here. And you've heard me say that China remains a, a uh, um, our, our pacing challenge going forward here. And I want to ask you, because you reached out today, it is 9-11, you reached out to the families who died when, with your remarks today. What would you like to say to the Afghans who fought beside us, who joined us in this war post 9-11? those who lost loved ones in this war, those who are still worried about their future? Well, we're, we're certainly uh, we're grateful for, for their help in our efforts to uh, help uh, improve the conditions in their country. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, it, you know, their partnership, those people who have served as interpreters and who facilitate our operations, uh, I certainly want to say thank you to them and remind them that we will remain grateful uh, going forward. That was VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Bob speaking with U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. Boxer Samuel Taki is a national hero in Ghana after winning a boxing bronze medal in the Tokyo Olympics. He now has his sights set on becoming a professional. David Doyle has more. This was the welcome that greeted Ghana's first Olympic medalist in 29 years. Samuel Taki arrived back at Accra's airport last month, proudly sporting his boxing bronze medal. As you can know, Olympic Games is a very uh, highest platform, biggest platform in, you know, uh, in, uh, in 29 years. Ghana have never uh, brought a medal, uh, taken a medal in the Olympic Games. So uh, that time uh, I was very happy there to break that record. Taki is the latest boxing sensation to emerge from the capital's historic Jamestown district. Five of Ghana's six world champions rose to glory from here. But until last month, no Ghanaian had won an Olympic medal for boxing in 49 years. Taki has been training since he was a boy at the Discipline Boxing Academy, a gym fashioned from an old jailhouse. The 20-year-old accredits much of his success to his coach, Lawrence and Popo Quay. The training is first, training is everything. So uh, uh, I train every day. Uh, uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes when I don't come to training, you come and find me, you bring me to training. So uh, 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 me and our coach, our relationship is very tight, you know, it's very, very tight. And uh, I like how he's, uh, he is and he also likes how I am. Yeah. Quay believes Taki has the potential to be one of Ghana's all-time greats. And when, when you start watching fights, when you go there watching fights, he says, hmm, this boy, I can defeat him. I say, what, what taught you you can defeat him? They say, look at him. I think more than him. And the, that age, somebody, somebody telling me he think. I'm wondering, but I know he's think in the ring. <laughs> Taki has been a hometown hero since joining Ghana's national team three years ago. But with the Olympics and his euphoric return behind him, he's setting his sights on the next challenge. Good defense, good defense. Taki says he's training every day as he pursues plans to drop his amateur status this year and go pro. David Doyle of Reuters filed that report. An indigenous artist in Los Angeles is combining native traditions with augmented reality. Virginia Delu talks with her about how their artwork is recreated in a 3D program and why using this technology helps with understanding of her tribe's history. I grew up in Los Angeles. Part of my cultural ancestry is Tongva, which are the original people of Los Angeles. And a lot of my work revolves around looking at land, land access, our tribe is not federally recognized, which means we don't have a sovereign land base. So I always have this feeling that I'm, you know, moving through Los Angeles, moving through this territory that's my ancestral homelands, 
but there's all these private property signs and people call me trespassing or call me a trespasser. And so it's this odd feeling of, you know, this deep connection and then kind of also being told that I don't belong here. So I make these kind of constellation cosmic spaces as a way to kind of point people into interacting with something that they can recognize. A lot of my work um, references objects or culture that has been erased from the history books. And so I have to give a lot of history lessons and tell these stories in a way that people are not familiar with. So today I have some artists um, over here in the US. If I create an augmented reality artwork that is, uh, you're looking at it through your phone and it's activated in that physical space, that's a spatial artwork. So what we have at the um, LACMA is a spatial artwork. As my hand moves around this environment, I'm holding down the trigger and the red string is growing out of the controller. So what I'm doing here now is like I, I can grab the artwork in my, with my controllers and I can scale it up um, and look at it very closely. And what I've done is I've pulled in a photo of Mercedes artwork, uh, which I'm using as a reference at the bottom of this sculpture. And I'm um, then sculpting on top of it everything else, the ropes and the rocks. And then I uh, recreated it in a 3D program. This is Snapchat's Lens Studio, what we're looking at at the moment. So what you can see here is the same um, painted artwork. It's now been placed on the floor in this um, 3D environment. So I'll send it to uh, my device. So now we have the artwork, it's in my living room. I don't have a lot of space in my living room, so I'll shrink it down a bit. And you can see the artwork is now on the floor. Utilizing these new technologies and these things that maybe I haven't engaged with in the past is a way for me to insert and proclaim that, you know, Tongva people belong in the future visions of place, the future visions of art, and the future visions of technology. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.